Good morning, church. Why don't you stand as we worship our King today? I'd love to start us off with some prayer. God, we are so grateful that you invite us into a relationship with you through your son, Jesus. And this morning, as we take a few moments of, of our weekend to set aside and, and offer them back to you, God, take these songs, take uh, the, the sermon from Pastor Rick as an offering, an act of worship towards you. May you be honored and glorified by it. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to need your help this morning. Lots of singing, guys. You ready? Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Come on. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna. Turn to you. In your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make us new. Because when we see you, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. God is good, amen? When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Let's sing that again, because when we see you, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. And you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. God who saves us, worthy of all our 
Hosanna. 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 As we get ready and approach Holy Week, I want us to take some time this morning to think about Jesus and what he's done on the cross for us. I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross. You have won me with your kindness and chased me down when I was lost. And where would I be if it wasn't for the cross? And hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I was a priest. Now I'm not Cause with your blood you You bought my freedom Hallelujah For the cross And all my shame was with mercy and now your mercy will be my song to know the glory to know the power of the cross and hallelujah I thank you Jesus I was a prisoner now your blood you you bought my freedom hallelujah for the cross by your stripes I'm healed and by your death I live the power of sin is overcome it is finished it is done and by your stripes I'm Thank you, Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not. Cause with your blood you, you bought my freedom, and hallelujah for the cross, and hallelujah. by my
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. Because with your blood, you, you bought my freedom. Hallelujah for the cross. Amen. You guys can have a seat and take a look at this video. Good morning, Discovery Fellowship Church. We are so glad you're here with us today. Happy April. I can't believe it's already April. It's crazy how fast the year's going. I love it. But the cool thing is April brings a lot of incredible opportunities here at Discovery uh, to get connected and engaged and invite your friends and neighbors and coworkers to what's going on here. And of course, we're approaching Holy Week, right? When we celebrate the, the last days of Jesus' life here on this earth and everything he did for us. And one of the things we're gonna be doing, of course, we have our Good Friday service, Friday night, the 15th at 7 p.m. here at Discovery. Uh, this is when we're gonna take some opportunities to reflect on the death, the crucifixion of Jesus, what that was and what that means for us. Right. And then the next day, we've got our first ever Easter celebration, as we're calling it. We're inviting our entire community, everybody around us, to come to the church, 2.30 to 5.30. And we're going to have Easter egg hunts. There's going to be food. There's going to be a bounce house. And we've got invite cards. So go out into the lobby as you're uh, leaving this morning. Grab a couple of those cards and invite your friends and your neighbors. One of the things I'm super excited about for that one, Nathan, is that uh, our children's ministries director, Mickey, is going to be presenting the gospel at that event. So it's a great opportunity. Invite people who don't know Jesus so they can come and hear the gospel. That's so awesome. And then the next day we have Resurrection Sunday, our service uh, where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And again, we've got cards for you to invite people to that day. The gospel will be shared as well. And this is a great day to invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, anybody who doesn't yet know Jesus. This is a perfect day for them to come and hear the good news. And before all of that, on Sunday the 10th, we are hosting our annual Passover Seder dinner here at Discovery with Rabbi Jack Zimmerman coming to lead us through a traditional Seder meal. But what's incredible is he brings out Jesus in the midst of all of those Jewish traditions. Jesus was the center point and so many people have missed it. And Rabbi Jack brings that out for us, does a great job of sharing that with us. Registrations are open and space is limited. There's still a few spaces available now, so make sure you register. Feel free to invite people maybe who have never been to something like that before. It is an incredible night of learning and growing and celebrating. And man, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And as Matt said, it's filling up fast. Uh, so register, go to dfchurch.com or open up the Church Center app. And you can register for that right now, as well as register for guests if you uh, are bringing anybody. That morning, so that'll be April 10th, and that morning, Rabbi Jack will be preaching in our uh, main service as well, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, thanks again for being a part of Discovery Fellowship Church. Why don't you stand again wherever you are, here in person, at home, it doesn't matter, as the worship team continues to lead us through song. Oh, hi again. It's kind of awkward having me up there and then right here as well. Um, yeah, Alexis Webb, normally uh, she leads worship for us, and she's not feeling well this morning, um, and so that is why she is not here. But because of that, that means we're also going to postpone our hymn sing. We had that scheduled for tonight, um, but this was kind of her thing that she was going to be leading for us, and so we are going to reschedule that. We will let you know what those dates are, um, but for now, we are going to continue to sing Hosanna to our King. Hosanna is an expression of adoration and joy. And so as we sing Hosanna, it is to Jesus. It's not just a word that we say, it is Jesus, Hosanna. You are King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And so let's sing together.
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a crazy easy to step in at the last moment and kind of take over, so I appreciate your availability, and I so appreciate um, the wealth of talent that God has given us here at Discovery Fellowship, so we pray for Alexis's quick recovery, 
Welcome to each one of you who are present here this morning. It is great to see so many people coming back into the room again. It's such an encouragement. Welcome back to Sally. Great to see you here, Sally Thiessen. And uh, we appreciate you being a part of our worship time this morning. And also Tammy Miller, good to see you back from recovering from surgery. And each one of you. And welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. As you can see from the big screens, we are uh, still in. In fact, we are at the end of our little mini-series that we've been going through up to lesson number four this morning. And so if you brought your Bibles with you, I would invite you to find uh, the Gospel of Mark and chapter 11. And uh, as we do begin this morning, I just uh, would like to say that we who are Christians are called to follow God's great servant, in fact, the greatest of all time. And a major item on uh, Jesus' agenda for those of us who seriously want to follow him is uh, to become like him in our serving. Uh, so if you've tuned in over the last uh, three weeks or so leading up to today, what Mark's gospel in particular uh, has taught us, what have we learned, in fact, about becoming a servant? Well, in Mark chapter 1, if you recall, we saw that the author presents to us Jesus, God's great servant, who came to thoroughly change each one of our lives. Uh, he came with his father's full approval and empowerment, and he was, in fact, thoroughly tested in all ways, just as we are in our living. And he calls us to repentance from sin and renewal in and by his Holy Spirit. And he calls us to be willing to be changed, even transformed in the ways that we live. In week two of our study, we saw how Jesus came to change the world. And to change the world, Jesus transforms his followers into fishermen. And so if you are seriously following Jesus, you are fishing for men. If you're not fishing for men, uh, it might be fairly said that you are not seriously following Jesus. In week three, last week, we were in Mark chapters 8 and 9 and 10, and there we learned uh, what greatness at core is really all about. Greatness is not, we learned about popularity uh, or position or power. Greatness is about selflessly being willing to serve others so that the saving love of God can unfold uh, in the lives of others around us who need to know it. This morning... Uh, as Mark's gospel continues to unfold, we are going to discover together how God's great servant enters the city of Jerusalem uh, during his final week. And he does that with a passion. So let's pray as we prepare to study that together. Father, this morning, uh, it is a privilege for us to be able to gather together. We have perhaps uh, come to know that in some new ways over the, the last two years or so. Uh, we have learned a lot of lessons through this time of pandemic. We're grateful, Father, that you have brought us through it for the most part. Uh, but you have taught us many lessons, Lord, not the least of which is that we are utterly dependent upon you. We are dependent upon you for um, every breath that we take. Um, I pray this morning, Father, that these lessons that we're taking a look at about servanthood would not be lost on us, that it would not just be another sermon that we've come and listened to or something that we've cursorily studied, but in fact, Father, that this would find some rootage in our lives. Uh, you've told us in your word that it is always sent with purpose, and it does not come back to you unless it accomplishes what you've sent it for. And so we ask, Lord, that uh, you would take your word and that your Holy Spirit would just be our teacher this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Very early uh, in his public ministry, Jesus gave a simple yet really very powerful sermon. It's perhaps his most famous. He delivered it up in the north of the area of the land of Israel, the area that's called the Galilee. It was delivered on the north side of the sea, just up the hill from his adopted home, which is the city of Capernaum. Here is a modern day picture of that very spot. Matthew, the former tax collector, uh, and writer of the gospel, which bears his name, was there. He remembers in chapter 5, verse 3, that seeing the crowds, 
ASP, that is, Jesus went up on the mountain and his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and then Jesus begins this section of teaching with what scholars have called the Beatitudes. It's called that because each of the following sentences begin with the word blessed, makairos in Greek. It can mean happy, it can mean favored by God. He gives us nine of them, and here's the first four. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, it's this fourth one in particular that I'd like us to think about for a little bit today. About this fourth beatitude, Dr. Haddon Robinson wrote this in his book entitled, What Jesus Said About Successful Living. He writes, Frederick Forsyth, the writer of books about international intrigue, he wrote books such as The Day of the Jackal and uh, Dogs of War, along with about 20 other bestsellers, says the greatest motivation in the world is hunger. Hunger is sacred. Whether one speaks of food, pleasure, or power, hunger drives us. Haddon Robinson writes, advertisers understand this. They know hunger moves merchandise. They motivate us to buy their product by playing upon our deepest desires. Subtly, they promise what no product can ultimately deliver. They make us believe that the basic hungers and thirsts of life will be satisfied by junk food and soda pop. The advertisements for Las Vegas, Reno, Atlantic City promise happy holidays and one's deepest desires satisfied. After a few days of feasting from that table, people discover they have been eating nothing more than large bites of cotton candy. Fun seekers leave those places more hungry than when they arrived. Jesus Christ, he continues, has a different diet. It starts with hungering and thirsting after righteousness. People in the ancient Near East had meat once a week if they were fortunate. Many in that day lived on the edge of starvation. They had a limited diet. They understood gnawings in their bellies, throats parched and dry. But when Christ talked about hungering and thirsting, he meant a deep desire to be righteous. Yet today, Haddon Robinson wonders in his book, I'm not sure that righteousness takes top billing on our desired menu list. Now, if you were with us last week, perhaps you remember when we met together that we saw Jesus on the move, starting way up north in the city of Caesarea Philippi, the place where Caesar could be worshipped as God, and where the gates of hell prevailed in the thinking of pagan worshippers. It was the place where Jesus wanted to know from his disciple what the word on the street was about him. And he wanted them to tell him who they thought that he truly was. And if you remember, the apostle Peter got it right when he proclaimed, you are the Christ, the Messiah. But he was wrong about what Jesus' messiahship would look like. Next scene, the entire entourage begins to move south. Jesus listening to his disciples, bickering about who was the greatest as they're going along the way, jockeying with one another about who was going to get the favored position. Jesus calls him on the carpet after his dinner in the seaside uh, city of Capernaum. And then not too long after that, in Mark chapter 10, they are headed towards the big city of Jerusalem. Jesus knows full well that he is going there to be arrested, to be tortured, and to be sacrificed on a bloody cross. On the way, the sons of thunder... James and John incongruously ask for the inside track from him on positions of power and glory in the new kingdom that they expect Jesus to inaugurate. But that wasn't what Jesus was about. He was headed south in obedience to God, we know from Scripture, to be a ransom for many, for whosoever would be willing to believe. When they arrive to the east of the city, Mark chapter 11 records that there was some wild fanfare that erupted as he prepared to enter David's city. The city, in fact, was already swollen with thousands of tourists and pilgrims gathering there in anticipation of the coming annual Passover feast. And so, the word began to spread like wildfire that the celebrity Jesus was coming, and anticipation reached a fever pitch. 
He descended down a pathway on the western slope of the Mount of Olives. This is the view of it today. Looking from Jerusalem east towards the Mount of Olives. Jesus is riding on a young donkey that his disciples had fetched for him. As he rides down towards the big city, thousands of people are lining the pathway and they threw their cloaks down on the ground for him to ride over. And they waved leafy palm branches in homage as you would to arriving royalty or to some celebrated famous commander. He rides down into the shallow Kidron Valley, right there below the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he arrives at the Jerusalem city wall, he enters through the eastern, or what's called the Golden Gate. And here is an actual picture of that gate today. This was in direct fulfillment of Psalm 24, 7 to 10, and the prophecies of Ezekiel 44 and Zechariah 9, 9. By the way... Uh, this is the very same gate he will enter once again when he comes back bodily at the end of the future seven-year tribulation period in fulfillment of Zechariah 14, verses 3 through 4. Now, not only do evangelical Christians believe this, but Orthodox Jewish rabbis believe this is where the Messiah will enter the city when he comes. They just think that it will be his first visit, not his second coming. And interestingly, Muslims know that the Jews believe that the Messiah is coming this way. They can read scripture just like we can. And so that's why they planted a cemetery right there in front of the city gate. Because they know that no Jewish holy man in his right mind would ever defile himself by walking through a Muslim cemetery. But just to make doubly sure, the Muslims in A.D. 1541 under Sultan Suleiman sealed up the entire eastern gate with stones and cement so that no one, especially a Messiah, could possibly get in. The problem is they forgot to read the Gospel of John chapter 20, which reveals to us that little detail that Jesus can actually walk through walls or move mountains for that matter. A concrete and stone wall should not be a problem. So as Jesus approaches the city, there is this wild scene and a, and a roar of, of singing and shouting and dancing. And in Mark chapter 11, verse 9, it says... Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna. Now, in Hebrew, that is Hosanna. You heard Matt talk about it earlier. It literally is translated, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. God's great servant entering God's great city, which God's great scripture had prophesied in Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. But, as he enters God's chosen city in the midst of God's chosen people, what is he really doing? What is he looking for? What is the passion of the Christ? What is his hunger? Was he there that day for a coronation ceremony? Did he come to usurp the authority of Rome and cast out the filthy occupiers? If so, he probably should have found himself a war horse instead of a baby donkey and strapped on a bit of armor and had a big sword in his hand, right? Then he could have marched with his entourage up to the Roman Antonia Fortress and garrison right there next to the great temple in the city and smashed down the doors. Out with you jokers. There's a new king in town. I am here to kick tail and take some names today. Who wants to be first in line for some of me? But he didn't do that. Jesus is not a man of violence. He didn't show up at the Oscars to slap anybody's face. Jesus 
never in his life resorted to violence to accomplish his purposes. Except for one time. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But what is Jesus showing his disciples about being a servant of God? I think that Mark is moved by the Spirit of God to give us a vivid portrait of Jesus. And it's this. God's servants, like Jesus, are passionate for righteousness. They hunger for it. It's a hunger that is obvious. It's a hunger that is expressed in their impact and in their influence in the world. God's greatest servant, Jesus, comes into the city and he is passionate for righteousness. And if you were to ask me, well, Rick, what do you mean by righteousness? What are you talking about? What does that really even mean? I would say to you, it is not complicated. The truth is, righteousness is that which conforms to God's character and to God's heart. Righteousness is that which expresses in my living and your living that which God has declared in His Word to be moral and right. And righteousness rejects in our living what God has declared to be immoral and wrong. It's not complicated. And those who know God and love God have an appetite for rightness. God's children have an appetite for their father's rightness and his character. For truth instead of falsehood. For humility rather than pride. For purity rather than corruption, for faithfulness and self-sacrificing love rather than adultery and selfishness. Jesus came into Jerusalem, the scripture says, in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, righteous and having salvation. And so, in these final days, leading up to his crucifixion, Jesus gave his followers a portrait of a servant who was passionate, who was hungry for righteousness. What did that portrait look like? It looks like this. Three things. Number one, a hungry for righteousness servant realizes when the fruit of righteousness is absent. A hungry for righteousness servant realizes when the fruit of righteousness is missing. Look for a moment at Mark 11, beginning in verse 11. This, I think, is a very interesting episode here. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. He goes into the great temple complex. It was called Herod's temple because he had reconstructed it, but it was God's temple. It was a huge 37-acre complex outfitted with magnificent buildings and courtyards and sacred spaces. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Note that. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say that. They heard it because he wasn't mumbling, he was pronouncing. Now, that's a rather odd incident, isn't it? Doesn't that strike you as a bit weird? Think about it. On Sunday, we call it Palm Sunday, Jesus rides into town in the afternoon uh, to a triumphal procession. He looks around town for a bit. He looks in the temple. It's getting late in the day, and so he goes back to the little town of Bethany outside of Jerusalem to spend the night, presumably at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. The next morning, he gets up, and he heads back to Jerusalem. 
You would think that his hosts would have served him breakfast before he left, but maybe he left early. Regardless, the text says that he was hungry when he gets to town. And so, as he's walking, he sees a leafy fig tree in the distance. These trees grow both wild and cultivated all over the place in central and in northern uh, Israel. Even today, they're almost as common as olive trees. He goes over to this fig tree to see about getting something to eat. And when he arrives at it, he sees that there is no fruit on it. But duh, that's because it's not the right time of season. So he pronounces a curse upon the tree. Now, as you might suspect, this remarkable incident has caused no small amount of gastrointestinal distress for some biblical commentators. What's going on here? Clearly, it wasn't yet the season for the fig fruit to be on the tree. Why is Jesus looking for something to eat there and finding nothing, and then audibly, out loud, curses the tree when he does not find a snack? Does Jesus not know what season it is? Is it only bread and fish that he can multiply out of thin air, but not fruit? He can restore eyesight and regenerate limbs and fix spinal paralysis, but he can't make a fig appear on a tree? What's going on? Well, not to get too horticultural on you, but in the land of Israel, um, this was the month of Nisan, or April to us. At this time of year, right now, in fact, fig trees naturally produce crops of small edible green buds. These early green fruit buds were a very common food for peasants to gather back in the day, to gather and to consume. They were plentiful and they were nutritious. These early buds on a leafy tree would drop off once that normal crop of figs would ripen in late May or early June in Israel. But in the case of this scripture, Mark 11, the fact that this tree was leafy and healthy looking but had no edible fruit buds on it when there in fact should have been meant that in fact it would not be bearing any figs later on in the season when it was supposed to, it would just be a leafy, fruitless shade tree. But the larger truth that Jesus was using this particular fig tree to get a message across to his disciples and to the nation of Israel was this. He went to that fig tree hungry on purpose. And he knew in advance that it would not have any edible buds on that tree. And he and everyone else present there that day knew what was oftentimes found in the Old Testament scripture. And that is that the prophets often spoke as the fig tree as descriptive of Israel's status before God. You see it there in Jeremiah, when I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine nor figs on the fig tree, even the leaves are withered. I'm looking for the fruit of righteousness, God says, like someone who is looking for clusters of grapes on a vine or a harvest of figs, and instead there is nothing there but deadness. Or Micah chapter 7. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright, or insert the word righteous there, among mankind. And in the Old Testament, the destruction of the fig tree is pictured Uh, as the judgment of God. Hosea says, and I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, these are my wages which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. Now remember, Mark 11, 11 said that Jesus had spent the day before this one looking around at everything. He saw the beautiful temple. He saw all the priestly activity. He saw that there was a big parade of of people arranged. He saw the Passover festival preparations and all the decorations going on in that day. Listen to what Dr. William Lane says. 
just as the leaves of the fig tree concealed the fact that there was no fruit to enjoy. So the magnificence of the temple and its ceremony conceals the fact that Israel had not brought forth the fruit of righteousness demanded by God. Israel too often honored God with their lips when their heart was far from Him. God was not then, and He is not now, impressed with lip service. Because, you know, from a distance, people can look good, right? People can go through the motions and participate in all sorts of things and say the right sorts of words, but God knows if true alignment with His righteousness is there. And we won't take the time to read it for the sake of time today, but Mark adds the comment in chapter 11 and verse 20 that the next day, that very same fig tree had withered overnight from the roots up. And so, this was a prophetic illustration from Jesus that Israel had been judged as unfaithful and no longer of service to God. So, that's the first thing. A hungry for righteousness servant realizes when the fruit of righteousness is missing. Here's the second aspect of the portrait. A hungry for righteousness servant expresses passion when righteousness has been compromised. A hungry for righteousness servant gets fired up when rightness is compromised. Look at Mark 11 verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Notice that word, it's the word ethnos, another word for Gentiles, but you he says, have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Astonished is the word ekpleso. It might be translated to astound or to overwhelm, or we might even say it colloquially today as to blow their minds. There's so much more here uh, then we have the time really to get into this morning. But I mentioned before that Jesus wasn't a violent man, right? He only demonstrated violence as a mean means to an end one time in his life, right here. And Psalm 69 gives us a clue as to why. It says, for zeal for your house consumes me. Now, a little context here perhaps might help explain Jesus' passion. At that time, on the east side of Jerusalem, just outside the wall, where that Muslim cemetery exists today that I showed you earlier, there were, in the early New Testament uh, first century, at least four marketplaces where animals could be purchased for the worship sacrifices, and where the Roman and the Greek coinage could be exchanged for acceptable Hebrew coinage for temple taxes and giving to God. The Jews would not accept Roman or Greek coins because they bore on them the image of Caesar or other human beings. And so they considered that to be idolatrous. So you had to exchange it into Hebrew coinage first for a small premium, of course. Up until the year 30 AD, all of that... Um, Middle Eastern marketing and commerce and, and financial exchanging happened outside of the city walls or far from the temple courts. But in A.D. 30, the ever clever Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, became a champion of free enterprise. And he allowed commercial competitors to establish those very marketplaces inside, right inside the temple, in the temple's court of the Gentiles, the people's court, if you will. He let businessmen set up their franchises in the place where people who were not Jews were supposed to be able to worship God. And he did that for a piece of the pie and a cut of the action, which he would often then line his pockets and the other priestly officials with. 
The court of the Gentiles was to be the place where non-Jews seeking to worship the Lord of the universe could come, they could pray, they could seek the Lord, they could offer their worship and their sacrifices there. But now, with the installation of these animal stalls and bird cages and kiosks selling wine and oil and salt and public haggling there over the exchange rates, a sacred place of worship had been converted into an oriental bazaar. Jesus saw it for himself when he came on Sunday, and now it's Monday. And he's back to fulfill an obligation that was laid on him by prophecy. Zechariah 14, every vessel in Jerusalem and Judah shall be sacred to the Lord of hosts. And there shall no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. And the words of Jeremiah has this house, which is called, God says, by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold... I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Now we know, all of us, at least if you're somewhat tuned, that last week at the Academy Awards ceremony, a well-known actor stood and he violently slapped a comedian because he had publicly offended the honor of his wife. He was right to defend her honor, but he was wrong in how and when and where he did it. Jesus, on that day, violently cleaned house. The only, as I said, violent act ever recorded in the life of our Lord. But he was right in what and where and when he did it. A hungry for righteousness servant who refused to allow his father's righteous name and honor to be compromised. Here's the third aspect of the portrait. A hungry for righteousness servant speaks truth to unrepentant hypocrisy. A hungry for righteousness servant has an appetite to speak truth to unrepentant hypocrisy. Mark chapter 12. And he began to speak to them. And the them here is the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, all of the religious leaders of the nation. He said, a man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit from the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent to them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent another and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. Verse 6, he had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, hey, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. And then verse 10, have you not read this scripture? It's a quote, a direct quote, it's a clear messianic prophecy from Psalm 118 verses 22 to 23. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And here's their follow on response, right? Hey. You think he's talking about us? I think he's talking about us. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. For they perceived that he had told the parable against them, so they left him and went away. But we know the rest of the story, right? They were cowards, uh, but they didn't give up, and they kept after him. And before the week was out, they had conspired and concocted and captured and crucified an innocent man, the Son of God, Savior of the world. They killed their Messiah. What a sad epitaph for the Jewish nation of that day. But that was their choice. In 1888, the famous 
Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel, awoke one morning to read his own obituary in the local newspaper. <laughs> Can you imagine that? That'll wake you right up, I suppose. It read, Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite who died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in war than ever before. He died a very rich man. In point of fact, it was actually Alfred's older brother, Ludwig, who had died. The newspaper reporter had made a mistake. But that account had a profound effect on Alfred. He decided that he wanted to be known for something other than the legacy of developing a means to kill people efficiently and amassing a fortune in the process. So, Nobel initiated the Nobel Prize as a part of his estate, which would be awarded each year to those who, quote, during the preceding year have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind and fostered peace. And Nobel was quoted as saying, every man ought to have the chance to correct his epitaph in midstream and write a new one. Now here's the thing I think that ought to get our attention. That, gener that generation of Israel had their Messiah standing right before them. They had every opportunity to respond to Him, to respond to the way, the truth, and the life. Even in those moments when Jesus described them and confronted them with that vineyard parable, they still could have repented. They could have been known for something other than a hypocritical rejection of Jesus. The hungry for righteousness servant gave them that opportunity. A servant of God aligned with God's heart is passionate for righteousness, realizing when it's absent, passionate when it is compromised, willing to speak directly truth to hypocrisy. You and I, we belong, we follow a servant who loves righteousness, who hates wickedness. So, how does that appetite, how does that thirst show up in our living? Now, I can't know your heart, and I may not know your story, but I know this. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus, what you need first and foremost is God's gift of righteousness. A gift God gives you when, you're, when you place your personal faith in Jesus Christ as your necessary sacrifice for sin. It's not something that you and I can get by trying to be better. It's not something you get uh, by coming to church or tuning in every week. It's not something you can earn, but it is a gift that you can receive. You need this more than anything else in your life right now. And you can have it right now. It comes to you when you, in all sincerity and in faith, simply say to God, Father in heaven, please forgive me of my sin. Today I choose to place my faith, to place my trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, alone. I believe that He died in my place paying the full penalty that my sin deserves. I believe that you raised him from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. By faith, I receive that gift of righteousness in place of my sin. Please come into my life. Make me your child by your Spirit. Help me to grow in the Lordship of Jesus Christ in my living. You acknowledge your sin and you ask for God's forgiveness. You acknowledge Jesus Christ as the only Son of God and your Savior, and you acknowledge that He will be the Lord of your living by His Spirit. It's not complicated, and that can happen for you today. If you are a Jesus follower today, what can we take from our Lord's example? How does an appetite for righteousness show up in your life. Perhaps it shows up in your prayer life, pleading that God will give you somebody 
that you know needs to wake up to God's spirit and needs to be brought personally to repentance. Perhaps it shows up in your courageously speaking the truth in love, even to hardened hypocritical hearts. Perhaps it shows up in quiet and maybe unnoticed ways in which you simply honor God with what you have, with what you do. Shall we not ask the Spirit of God to make us passionate for righteousness, like our great example and our Savior? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look at your words once again this morning. We thank you for the, great, the greatest example of all in Jesus Christ, the greatest servant who ever lived. Help us, Father, to be willing to follow in his footsteps. In his name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Melinda and team. Would you stand with us as we're dismissed this morning? Father, may that be our prayer as we walk from this room this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you and love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.